The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to the webinar. The title of today's webinar is Understanding Decisional Capacities of Older Adults, and I'll introduce our speaker shortly. Uh, next slide. A quick disclaimer before we get started, the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, are projects of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. The contractors and or the speaker's findings, conclusions and points of view, do not necessarily represent those of the federal government. So, next slide. A quick note about our APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us at any time. There'll be some contact info displayed at the end of the webinar. Um, and we work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Next slide. Please consider joining one of our peer-to-peer -peer calls. Uh, we have three calls per month, one for investigators, one for supervisors, and one for administrators in APS. Um, the schedule for these calls is on your screen. You can check out our website or email us for more information if you'd like to hear about those. Uh, next slide. We also have a page on our site dedicated to COVID-19 and APS. Uh, there's a link on this page and uh, there's a red box at the top of our site. So on this page, you'll find information from the Administration for Community Living on grants, uh, resource information on COVID, and a report on the impact of COVID-19 on APS programs that we recently completed. Uh, next slide. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. Today's slides are available to download in the handouts section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Just click on the icon that resembles a little piece of paper, and you can download them from there. All participants are muted for this webinar and you must use your computer to access audio. So please adjust the volume of your computer speakers to the desired level. And if you have any problems today with the audio or viewing the slides, our best suggestion is to exit the webinar and then re-enter. That seems to fix a lot of the issues that folks have. So, Next slide. If you have any questions of our presenter, simply type them in the questions box at any time. We'll pause for questions at the end, and we'll get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify everyone via email, um, or at least all the people who are registered today, when it has been posted online so that you may watch it from there. And then also you'll receive an automatically generated email within 24 hours that includes a link to your certificate of attendance if you need that for your records. Next slide. So now we'll do a quick attendee poll, which I will launch right now. So your screen will change and you'll have this question up on your screen. And our question for you is, which of the following categories do you identify the most with? Um, do you consider yourself an adult protective services professional, other social services professional? Um, maybe you work in, in social work, but outside of APS. Um, are you a medical professional, a legal professional, or do you not really fit any of those categories? And you can vote by clicking directly on your screen um, to the category that corresponds um, best to how you identify your profession. We'll leave this open just for a little bit so that folks can vote. Looks like we got about half the audience who's voted. We'll give it just a few more seconds. Um, if you're in full screen mode, you may need to exit full screen mode to click on, on the category if you'd like to vote. So if you're having problems voting, that could be the issue. But again, you can just click directly on your screen um, and vote uh, for the, the option that you identify the best with. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out now and then display the results for everybody. So it looks like 45% of you are adult protective services professionals, 35% work in some other social service setting, 5% um, consider yourselves medical, 4% consider yourselves legal, and then 11% of folks um, fit into some other category, not those, those that we had displayed for you. So thank you for taking that poll for us. It gives us a good idea of who our audience is. Um, next slide. 
So I would like to introduce today's speaker. I think we're in for quite a treat because I think she's fantastic. Dr. Sherry Gibson received her PhD in clinical psychology with an emphasis in geropsychology from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. She is an instructor and clinical supervisor for the psychology department at UCCS and a faculty affiliate with the UCCS Gerontology Center. Dr. Gibson serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Elder Abuse and Neglect. She's a member of the Research Committee for the National Adult Protective Services Association, and she's a member of the Pikes Peak Elder Abuse Coalition. In addition to being an advocate for elder justice, Dr. Gibson has a private psychotherapy and consultation practice, which includes provision of capacity evaluations, expert testimony, consultation, and training. Um, for more information on Dr. Gibson's services and resources, visit her website, www.sherrygibson.com. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Dr. Gibson. We greatly appreciate it. Now we'll turn the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Andy. And I also want to thank Leslie, who is muted right now, but she is responsible for advancing the slides. And so I really want to thank uh, the two of you and thank APS for uh, allowing me to inviting me to do this presentation today with all of you. Um, I did want to make one small correction on my website. It is drsherrygibson.com, so it's dr and then my name.com. So just wanted to make sure you had that correct information. Well, welcome uh, from my home city of Colorado Springs, Colorado. And as I look out my window, we had seven inches of fresh white snow today. Um, so it's a chilly one. Uh, but I want to welcome all of you to this webinar to a topic that is really important to me and has been a part of my professional work for probably the last 10 or 12 years in providing, uh, conducting capacity evaluations and working very closely with adult protective services. APS has a soft spot, a soft spot in my heart. Um, I work really closely with my state APS, so big shout out to uh, Colorado, who's on the call, I hope, and all of my colleagues um, across uh, the country. So please advance the slide, Leslie. So I want to start out first by saying that uh, this topic of understanding decisional capacities of older adults is it's a really big one. It's one that we could probably spend a half day mulling over, and I wish we were all in the same room because I know that I would learn a lot from our discussion and our dialogue. But what I hope to um, convey to you today or share with you today is really uh, just an overview of aging and what happens in just normal aging processes that uh, might lead to a diminishing um, capacity um, in decision making and also providing a conceptual framework that psychologists and neuropsychologists and I would even say forensic psychologists use when assessing uh, decision decisional capacity and then also to highlight really the importance of uh, providing person-centered assessment and more importantly recommendations that emphasize that least restrictive alternative to decision making. Uh, oftentimes we think that guardianship is the end all be all um, intervention. And as all of you know, uh, it within APS is that we want to look for the least restrictive. So I'm going to I'm going to touch um, touch on supportive decision making and what that looks like as an alternative to more restrictive uh, interventions. And also I think highlighting here the tension that often arises between two very important ethical uh, principles, and that is the principle of autonomy and beneficence, uh, to do no harm or to remove harm and suffering. Um, and that can get very tricky. I think in um, in, in, the, in the topic of capacity evaluation or determining one's capacity, um, those ethical principles come up a lot. And I know it comes up a lot for you in APS, um, respecting that people are autonomous until proven otherwise, and that in that autonomy, they can often refuse services, um, which can be quite a barrier for APS. Um, in providing some essential interventions to folks. Also, I think it's important here that we emphasize the, um, the cultural differences 
that make up this diverse group of older adults and adults at risk uh, who in those cultural differences that shape people's preferences and their values. And that can also contribute and impact the way we think about capacity, the way we understand a person, person's decisions, um, and, and again, respecting those cultural differences. And then lastly, I really want to share some of the things or, or ways in which I have uh, collaborated with APS and some thoughts about how we can do that better, how we can streamline maybe the referral process, how we can think about um, collaborations and partnerships that really uh, support the individual and, um, and, and so that we can come to the best conclusion and also make the best recommendations that will enhance that person's well-being and possibly even enhance their capacity. Next slide. I want to share a very complex case, but I but before I do that, a little bit of a disclaimer here. Um, it seems that for me anyway, and even though I've done this for I've done capacity evaluations, like I said, about the last 10 or 12 years, every week when I get a referral, each referral is unique and each one seems just as complex or complicated as the last one. And so I often remind myself of a quote that was offered by a Zen monk, um, Shunrai Suzuki or Suzuki Roshi as, as referred to also. And what he said is in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are few. Now, I know that I'm considered an expert in this area, especially when I have to offer expert testimony. But I am also very much aware at every intervention or at every interaction that I have in, in assessing capacity and looking at the person in context, that, I'm a, that I am reminded to be a beginner, to look at it through a beginner's mind, because that offers the opportunity for us to see things more holistically and to see the person in context so that we can really understand the decisions that they're making and understand where we can be most effective. So I wanna to present to you first um, a recent, just within the last year, uh, this particular uh, scenario that came to me as a referral. I'll refer to this gentleman as Mr. Richards. He was a 51 year old, um, never married, did not have any children, African-American gentleman who was living with his 91-year-old father for the past 25 years. APS had opened a case on Mr. Richards uh, because there was a report filed by a VA social worker who, who had visited the home to actually help the 91-year-old veteran. And when she uh, came to the home, discovered that the home was in horrible shambles. Uh, the two men did not seem to be faring well. Uh, the 91-year-old father appeared to have some dementia that was uh, developing or had been developing. Um, he also was wheelchair bound. The 51-year-old uh, gentleman was his caregiver and was also tasked with helping with his incontinence care, which had gotten out of control. So the VA social worker called uh, APS to report um, the 51-year-old client, Mr. Richards, as an at-risk adult. Mr. Richards was considered at risk because he had a prior diagnosis of intellectual developmental disabilities and also had a history of mental illness. Um, he'd been hospitalized in inpatient uh, psychiatry for uh, twice over, I think, in the past year. And so there were concerns about how these two individuals were able to live together. And there were real concerns about um, Mr. Richard's father, who was determined to need a higher level of care outside of, the, of what he could get from the home. So, uh, so there we have two people, right? And Mr. Richards, the 51-year-old son, um, had stated that his preference was to move out of the home once his father was placed in a nursing uh, community uh, to find, to get his own apartment. He wanted to live independently. His father had been his representative payee for many years and it had 
uh, managed um, his son's finances for all that time. And so very complicated situation, right? You could, I'm sure many of you have had a similar situation that you've entered. Oh, next slide, please. <laughs> I'm over here advancing my slide and I can't do it. Thank you, Leslie. So where do you begin? Well, potentially you've got two referrals here, right? You have the son who we want to know, does that person have the capacity to make the decision to live independently? And could he functionally live independently? Can he make his own autonomous, independent decisions around his living situation? And for the father, we may need to know, does he have the capacity to make independent decisions around his own health care, including having to move or transition to a higher level of care? And is he able to continually manage his son's financial affairs as he had in the past? So some other things that we want to consider in this case is, um, are there family members who are involved to help provide some maybe supportive decision-making for either individual, or do these individuals require a higher level of decision-making help, such as a surrogate decision-maker, such as a guardian? And what is the least restrictive living situation for both of these individuals who'd been living together for a long time, been managing it well uh, for a long time, but appears to not be doing well now. And so embedded in that, we want to know what are their cognitive strengths or limitations. And when we look at the son, Mr. Richards, knowing that he had also an intellectual disability diagnosis in addition to a mental health diagnosis, how do those play into his decision making and into his functional abilities as well? Next slide. I think it's important to highlight here, and you know, I'll come back to Mr. Richard's case. Um, I might come back to it if we have time, because I'm going to share some other um, case studies with you, or, or case examples, if you will, that I've been involved in to um, help kind of put meat onto the skeleton of capacity. But there are two terms that have been used historically interchangeably, and that is competency and capacity. And um, it can lead to some confusion. So I thought it might be a good idea to uh, talk a little bit about that. In the past, we've used the term capacity to describe a clinical finding uh, regarding decisional abilities. Um, and competency, on the other hand, has really been uh, used to describe a legal or judicial determination of legal status. So the distinction, that distinction is kind of less useful today um, as, ter as the term capacity is increasingly being used um, and, and employed by the law. Uh, capacity is now favored uh, in recent legal reform uh, efforts, such as in the area of adult guardianship. Um, although competency still shows up in older statutes and is more common within criminal law. And so when, when we look at clinical capacity versus legal capacity, then clinical capacity is, is designated within a medical or clinical setting. Um, it's a judgment as to whether or not that individual has the ability to successfully carry out either a specific task or make a, dis, a, a specific decision, such as around medical treatment, or it may be around driving ability. And the clinical findings of incapacity really doesn't change or alter that person's legal status. However, legal capacity is determined and designated by a court. So these are the situations where I will offer a, a determination of clinical capacity based on my clinical judgment. Does the person lack the capacity to do X task or to make X decision? But it's within the guard or within the hearing, if you will, where legally the court may designate that person to lack capacity. And, and that refers to the specific ability or abilities under the law that um, that person can sufficiently carry out a specific um, action. The court then decides, does this person say, for example, can they execute a will or make this treatment decision? 
the court's decision of incapacity does alter a person's legal status. Next slide, please. Now, historically, probate law, which many of you are fam probably most familiar with, uh, especially those of you who work within APS, probate law has viewed capacity in the past as an absolute or global concept. I often think um, the image of a light switch, you either got it or you don't, it's off or it's on. And however, though, in recent years, the law has shifted towards really appreciating the more nuances of capacity to understand that there needs to be more of a task or decision specific standard of capacity, recognizing that a person can have capacity in one area or not another. And I think this plays out um, most relevantly in the area of financial capacity. Some of the uh, very important work has been, uh, that's been done in this field um, has been studied by Dr. Peter Lichtenberg. And he looks at financial decision making and what he proposes is that there's really, uh, he and others who have been involved in this work, um, they look at decision making ability versus uh, financial execution. Financial execution looks like, you know, being able to balance one's checkbook, being able to pay your bills. That's the execution of financial ability, but that can be very different from, say, um, managing an estate or making decisions around changing a will or uh, donating uh, large sums of money. Um, and so we know that a person can have the capacity to do some tasks but might not be able to do uh, other things or may not have or may have um, deficient uh, ability in making big financial decisions, for example. So now because of that, because we've understand that there are nuances to different tasks, different abilities and capabilities, evaluations of capacity have evolved to include not only just the neurocognitive underpinnings, underpinnings around uh, decision making, but also pulling in the psychological and functional assessments using a spectrum of domain specific measures. And in the past, I'd say at least 20 years, We've um, really propelled the field in creating better measures, better uh, instruments that can measure a, a, a range of abilities for people. Next slide. I've listed here the different types of capacity that are typically evaluated by a psychologist, a neuropsychologist. And um, I would say of these that I've listed here, probably the three that I get the most referrals for is the first one, the capacity to consent to medical care, um, financial capacity, such as business transactions or managing one's personal finances, and then the capacity to execute or to, uh, um, to designate a power, a power of attorney for finances or healthcare. Those are probably the top three. I also do get pulled into some evaluations where people need to know if a person can consent to a sexual relationship um, or sexual relations. Capacity to drive certainly comes up, making a will, donating, uh, money or to make a, some kind of charitable donation or a gift, and then also participating in mediation can come up. But those first three that I mentioned are probably the most uh, typical, more common ones that I get, and particularly the ones that I receive mostly from, from Adult Protective Services. Next slide. The 1997 uh, definition of an incapacitated person um, as defined by the Uniform Guardianship and Protective Proceedings Act, uh, defines that this is someone who is unable to receive and evaluate information or make or communicate decisions to such an extent that the individual lacks the ability to meet essential requirements for physical health, safety, or self-care, even with appropriate technological assistance. I've highlighted here appropriate technological assistance because that's always at the center or should be at the center of all of our recommendations, for example. Um, and it's, it's a bit subjective too. 
what do I mean, you know, do I, what do I know about appropriate technological assistance? And would that be appropriate between one evaluator and another evaluator? Um, and so the, the way that I kind of resolve that for myself, and again, I'm talking about my own experience as an evaluator, is I think about, are there things that are missing from this person's current life that would enhance their capacity if they were offered those things or if those things were provided for them. I'll give you one, I think, very easy example. Uh, for older adults, particularly those that have hearing impairment, sometimes hearing impairment can mask or can lead to um, misdiagnosis of dementia. And so when a person cannot hear the information that's coming in, they're going to have a hard time encoding the right information and retrieving it later. And so an appropriate technological assistance recommendation may be that this person be evaluated for a hearing aid, that by being able to improve their sensory um, experiences, that they would be able to have a, a enhanced capacity as well. So that's one, one way. Uh, another, um, another recommendation may be that we have to aggressively treat a psychological or psychiatric condition that is causing a person to uh, not make good decisions, not make sound decisions, to be incapacitated. So if we were to aggressively treat their psychosis, or their symptoms of, say, major depressive disorder, that may enhance their abilities. Next slide. So I talked about the definition from 1997. Well, fast forward to 2017, the Uniform Guardianship, Conservatorship, and Other Protective Arrangements Act was put into place, yes, it's a long name, but great big changes, put into place some very important recommendations around new approaches to um, the language that we even use within our definitions of incapacity. So the old approach was that we often use terms such as ward or incapacitated person. You notice that the definition is the definition of an incapacitated person. What this act is proposing to us now is that we change our language to be a lot more person-centered, uh, such as adult subject to guardianship or the individual subject to conservatorship. And where previously or historically um, individuals were typically left out of the process. There might be reports that are written about that person's capacity, about what they can and cannot do. And not all the, not all times are those reports shared with that individual. Not, not every time is the individual um, made aware of the process and what, it, what to expect next in in that this determination, for example. And so we've often, I think we've done a disservice, and I think this is where this new act is really focusing, is we've done a disservice to really uh, giving, letting people know what their rights are, giving them all the information and being transparent about the process. And so now what we wanna do is we want to involve individuals, providing them with plain language explanation of their rights, and creating person-centered plans. What do I mean by that? I mean that it needs to be unique to that individual's current needs, to that individual's preferences, to that individual's cultural background, and the norms that are shaped by that cultural background, so that those kinds of, when we create that kind of person-centered plan, that can then be uh, monitored by the court when possible, and also can be upheld by guardians. And in fact, uh, just before this call, I was, I, I'm participating on a grant through the University of Colorado and our um, aging center there, where we are following uh, clients with whom we do these types of evaluations. And recommendations that we make around what could enhance their cognition, could enhance, enhance their well-being. And one of the things that we're doing there is we're following 
the client and their families through those recommendations to understand what are the barriers to people following through with our person-centered plans of care, those recommendations that we've offered, uh, and what are the ways that we can employ maybe even um, at care advocates who can walk that journey with a person. So this is some important work that's be being done, not only here in my community, but I know across the nation some innovative ways that we're taking the recommendations of this act and we're trying to employ it within our own jurisdictions. Next slide. Now, most of you on this call know that we're aging at an exponentially high rate. Um, we know that um, the group of people over the age of 65 will um, start to account for more than 20% of the U.S. population. Uh, we also know that normal aging is associated with some cognitive decline. Uh, for example, um, processing speed slows as we age naturally. Um, I'm noticing it as I approach 51 next month that I'm having a harder time processing things at the rate that I used to. Um, and so within that, we have to understand that each person has a culmination of both strengths and limitations that both contribute collectively to a person's functional abilities. Um, those normal aging processes can place older adults um, for higher risk of impaired capacity or vulnerability, for example, to exploitation. Uh, some of those um, impairments or some of those factors that can contribute to um, uh, increased risk is sensory impairment. So hearing impairment, vision impairment, isolation, any kind of mood disturbance, emotional dependency, um, a major life transition such as recent widowhood or moving to a new uh, community that is unfamiliar. These are things that can happen among older adults uh, that can lead to a higher risk. Next slide. And we also know that cognitive impairment while it's not part, dementia, I will say, is not part of the normal aging process, it does affect older adults as people get older. And we know that the, um, the, average, uh, rate or the average lifespan is increasing um, every uh, decade or so. And so what we know is that by 2050, over 15 million Americans will be affected by Alzheimer's disease. Um, dementia certainly places people at risk for difficulties with decision making. Although I want to say, and I, I think, I hope that this is a, a myth that most of us can debunk right here and now, is that having a diagnosis of dementia does not infer a person lacks capacity. I want to make that very clear because I think that uh, providers can make that mistake. Um, all too often that if we see a diagnosis of dementia or similarly, if we see a diagnosis of severe mental illness, that we automatically infer a lack of capacity. And so I want to say that that's something we really need to move away from. We need to understand that dementia can range from mild to severe. And again, capacity ranges based on tasks and the decision at hand. And so those two things have to be considered um, in context and as one that is uh, on a spectrum. Well, with the increased prevalence of dementia, because our, our society is aging more, we, you can, I mean, you can just infer that we've seen an increase in the need for capacity evaluations. Rarely does mild cognitive impairment trigger that type of capacity evaluation uh, or that uh, a capacity evaluation. But it's usually when somebody recognizes that the person is not is functioning very differently than they once functioned. Um, and you all, you know, walk into those situations, you get reports from uh, might be a healthcare provider, might be a psychologist, uh, might be a family member or a concerned neighbor who says, hey, I'm noticing that 
my patient, my neighbor, my family member is not doing well, something is wrong. I'll give you an example. A daughter might seek an evaluation, for example, or might call APS when she's noticed that her father isn't picking up um, his newspapers, or maybe a neighbor has called her and she lives out of state. That's probably even a better example. She lives out of state, neighbor calls her and says, hey, I, your dad's not answering his door. I notice his newspapers are being stacked. Last time I was in his house, looked like there was expired food sitting out on his counter. Um, I notice he's not coming out of the house enough. And so that's the kind of situation that might you know, trigger this type of evaluation, certainly trigger a report maybe to an APS to investigate a little further. Next slide. Another influence around the, the increase of capacity assessments or the need to understand people's abilities is this massive transfer of wealth from World War II to the baby boomer generation. So you have the people who are in that uh, certain age group of 65 to 75, for example, have a lot more wealth to be concerned about in terms of their management of it or exploitation um, of it being mismanaged by other people. We also know, you know from a societal and psychosocial perspective that blended families are living apart. Um, this often results in conflict uh, within family members over a, a person's medical care or their financial disposition. There's been a rise in contested wills and guardianships in probate courts, which then prompts um, an evaluation or a question around a person's capacity. And we also have seen a high prevalence of elder abuse, exploitation, and undue influence. And undue influence is that psychological component that often underlies most uh, financial exploitation situations where those uh, coercive tactics are used. And, and we see this happening not only by strangers, but mostly by family members, um, friends, and, and unfortunately, even professionals. Next slide. So in 2008, well, before 2008, um, a work group, a task force was developed uh, between two very important entities, the American Bar Association and the American Psychological Association. And these work groups uh, came together to, to put out three very important handbooks. Um, there's a handbook for attorneys, a handbook for judges, and a handbook for psychologists. And this handbook, I will just tell you, I'm sitting at my desk, I've got three of them, three copies, because I'm just worried that I'll lose one. I've been using this handbook since it came out in 2008. And in 2008, I was a second year clinical student in my doctoral program. And um, this, it, you can see, it's just frayed. There's all kinds of notes. There's lots in here. This has really become, for me as a psychologist, the Bible of capacity evaluations. And so much work has been done even since this publication. But most of the things that I'm gonna be sharing from this point forward really comes from the expertise and the guidance around best standards of, standards of providing um, and thinking about capacity, providing capacity value assessments for a range of abilities, decisions uh, that are faced by older adults. Next slide. So within that, within the, the handbook, one of the things that, that we look at is the elements of, say, consent capacity. I'm gonna use this in, in, in the framework of medical consent. We have to understand um, four, these four elements whenever we're evaluating a person's capacity. Can the person express a choice? Now, this requires probably the lowest amount of cognitive ability, if you will, to say what a person wants. I don't want to have chemotherapy. Okay, that's expressing a choice. The next one is understanding. Can the person consent to or refuse medical treatment based on their understanding 
of the treatment that's involved. So they need to have an understanding of the nature and the seriousness of their illness or their dis disorder. They have to understand the nature of the recommended treatment, the probable degree um, and duration of the benefits or risks of any treatment decision that they're making, included, including the consequences of lack of treatment. And I'll, 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 I'll give you a scenario so we can better understand that part. The, the third piece of this, the third element is an appreciation or what we also refer to as insight. That is the ability to relate the treatment information to a person's own particular personal situation, including hypothetical medical situations and being able to infer the possible benefits of that treatment. So this can look like, um, let's say, okay, this is an actual a question that sometimes we use in an assessment. Let's say you uh, have injured your hip and your doctor is telling you that it would take much effort through physical therapy and months of physical therapy before you were able to walk again. What would you do? That kind of question gets at a person's insight about the decision that they would make, but what would be the consequences of not following with the following through with the doctor's recommendations? How can they apply that maybe even to a current situation? And that really gives us um, a, um, a, a look at that person's insight, gives us some indication about their appreciation. And then the last one is reasoning. So based on that person's decision, are they able to state it in a rational way? And can they process that information in a logical manner? And it's important that their reasoning is consistent with their values. I also, one of the other things that the ABA and APA uh, task force has encouraged um, assessors to do is to, within these four elements of capacity, to try to appreciate if the person has made those statements to other people and has that been consistent over time. So if that person has stated that preference, say to their family member, also stated it to an APS caseworker, and then stated the same thing to me, that shows some consistency across different settings. It's also important that if the person always had a value of not being on life, say on life sustaining interventions, for example, if they've always said, I don't want to be on a ventilator, and then that changes, we have to appreciate what is changing that, uh, what, how that value has changed, and does that person have a rational or logical thought process around the change? So one example of when I pull all of these together, um, one example that I have is, let's say um, this was a person I actually worked with a, a while back, 86 year old widowed woman who her daughter uh, lives with her and who was diagnosed with um, end stage ovarian cancer. And the treatment that was offered to her was to do some, uh, I think it was chemotherapy that she could take, um, and it really wasn't about cure, it wasn't curative, but it was more about prolonging life and maybe in improving her life and she could do more things um, if she had more time. And so the client had uh, made a choice that she did not want to go through with chemotherapy. The daughter was very concerned about this and daughter was more anxious about it than the, than the patient. And so the physician asked that I um, evaluate her capacity to refuse uh, chemotherapy, knowing that there were benefits and risks to that treatment. And did, did her thought process, uh, did it have a, a you know, logical uh, manner to it? And did she really truly understand what she was refusing? So I did the evaluation with her. And she was able to state that 
as an 86 year old woman who had lost her husband and had been the caregiver for her husband for a number of years. She did not want to go through that. She had seen what those kinds of treatments do to a person. She felt that she was ready to, you know, just kind of move through life as in her term, in her uh, words, as God had intended it. She was ready to be okay with her own death. And, um, and what I determined after evaluating her cognition, after talking with her at some length, is that this really was, it was in line with her values. It made logical sense uh, the way that she understood it. She understood the ramifications of refusing the chemotherapy. And so I determined that she had the capacity to make that decision to refuse chemo chemotherapy. Now, her daughter was obviously distressed because her daughter wants to prolong her life. And that, that's an, it's a natural expression of her daughter just kind of anticipating the grief that's going to come from losing her last parent. Um, now, let's take that same situation and let's pretend that this person is, well, and I always love to play with this kind of hypothetical. Let's pretend that person is a 65 year old woman who has the same rationale, who has the same capacity to make the decision to refuse chemotherapy. Okay, does that change anything? Would that change how I view that particular situation because she's a much younger woman? Would I have seen it any differently? Well, I can tell you I wouldn't have, but that's a bias that we might have towards that person. Well, let's add another layer. Let's pretend that the person has uh, a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Does that alter the way we think about this? And would her rationale be different? So there are layers upon layers upon layers of where a similar situation will look very differently based on the person's diagnosis, based on their rationale, based on their cultural values. Um, so all of this has to be, is nuanced, but also has to be considered. Next slide. So age-related changes in cognition have been well-documented in our literature, and you all probably know that. Um, and it can occur secondary to different processes. I think what's important here is some, some information that came from um, the Medical Expenditures Panel Survey in 2004 found that 49%, nearly half of all U.S. adults have at least one chronic medical condition. Uh, over 25% have two or more. And then when you look at just older adults over the age of 65, nearly two thirds of our population have two or more medical conditions. So when you think about the medical comorbidities, that can lead to some diminished mental capacity by virtue of electrolyte imbalances, um, dehydration, medication effects, uh, vitamin deficiencies, fatigue and pain, inflammatory processes, all of these play a role in one's attention, concentration, processing speed, and an ability to encode information and retrieve information. That's a fancy phrase for saying memory. So those types of things can lead to that. And we, we always want to evaluate those partic particular um, uh, medical factors when evaluating uh, capacity. Next slide. Clinicians also must consider some common psychiatric comorbidities that can impair decision making, such as psychosis, um, severe depression, bipolar disorder. Persons with mental illness may be needed to be evaluated for capacity, particularly in cases of guardianship. Um, schizophrenia, for example, has been shown to impair one's attention, memory, uh, learning new information, executive functioning, so the ability to plan or multitask, impulsivity, um, all of that can impact real world functioning. And while mental illness can be considered, considered a disabling condition, 
It can also affect a person's uh, ability to manage finances or communicate decisions around their medical treatments. For example, you might have a client who has a fixed delusion about a life-threatening medical condition and also has paranoia towards their physician. Or perhaps it's a delusion about the medical condition itself. For example, a malignant tumor that might be believed to be placed by aliens in order to monitor that person's thoughts. So a person in that particular situation would likely lack capacity um, to make a decision or to refuse a life-saving treatment. Similarly, an older adult, for example, with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder would, might not be able to manage their finances during a phase of mania. So establishing the impact of serious mental illness with maybe even a dementia, a progressive dementia a disease process, that can get really tangled. And so it's up to a very um, uh, seasoned uh, clinician, uh, an assessor, to be able to untangle that and understand what might be impacting one thing or, or another. And again, looking at what could be added or what could be done to enhance this person's capacity. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I, when I talk later about a particular um, situation um, to kind of help with that. Okay, next slide. Values and preferences. This is huge. I can't say enough about the importance of understanding this in the context of uh, evaluating or thinking about a person's capacity to make a decision or to carry out a task. Values come from our beliefs, our concerns, our approaches to life. Um, I once read something that when we think about values, there typically are words that end in ing. So spending time with my family, going to church, um, eating, favorite foods. I've got a picture here you'll see, drinking red wine. I'm making this very public right now to 1,629 people who are on this call that I prefer red wine. That is probably never going to change. I'm just stating my, my value right now, drinking red wine at the end of the day. So I'm hoping that when I transition to a higher level of care, that a doctor will put in an order for one glass of Pinot Noir, uh, at, with dinner. So I'm just stating it in case any of you out there end up being my surrogate decision maker. <laughs> that, that's been recorded, Dr. Gibson. So we have that on record. You have it on record. Thank you. So glad. Um, preferences, on the other hand, is um, inferred or informed by our values. So these need to be, uh, we want to know, is that consistent? Is the person's preferences consistent with previously held values. I think this probably, this question comes up the most in APS around a person's living situation, their environment. So particularly around hoarding situations where you walk into um, a person's home and it just looks overwhelming. It smells, there's an odor about it. And so one of the questions that I often ask from either family members when I do a collateral interview, family members or people who, who have known this individual over time, is I'll, I'll say simply, tell me about your mother's values around housekeeping. And uh, I had this conversation with a, an adult son recently who, who laughed and said, she was never one to keep house. Well, that's important for me because it may be that her home is in such disarray because she's never been a housekeeper, but it, it also lets me know if there is some cognitive impairment, it may have gotten out of control because there's something else going on. So while she's never valued a clean house or has never placed value on that, it may have gotten really bad because something else is, is interfering. So we really want to understand that person's preferences and their values in, in context of capacity. Um, cognitive impairment also does not imply the inability for a person to state their values and to state their preferences. Um, it really takes the uh, 
I want to say the lowest cognitive load. What do I mean by that? It means people who have very some severe dementia or who have had traumatic brain injury can let us know what their preferences are. Um, even people who are nonverbal can let us know what their preferences are. And so um, we want to be very mindful of that, inquiring, but also asking people who've known them pre-morbidly what they've known about their preferences and their values. Um, and there needs to be some consistency between the current choices and those longstanding values uh, that can indicate um, uh, capacity. Values do change, right? So right now, red wine, and I don't think I'm going to change on the red wine thing. I'm pretty sure I've been I've been very consistent. But there was a time where a um, spiced rum and coke would have been my value. My preference. No, I guess the values really never change. The value has been to have a cocktail now and again, um, but my preferences have changed. Now values can also change. You know, spending time. Uh, at the gym at one point was a huge value of mine. Spending time at the gym seven days a week was a big value of mine. Well, now in this stage, not so much. My value for exercise hasn't changed, but the way I do it has changed. So we really want to understand and be f and and also give space to how that can evolve and f and fluctuate too. And we want to always remember everybody you, me, our clients are entitled to their values, no matter how eccentric they may be, no matter how, you know, we wouldn't do it that way, everybody's entitled, they have a right to their own values. Next slide. Paying attention to cultural norms in terms of um, how the, the diversity of our population, of all population, but particularly within uh, older adult population. You know, I'm talking more about older adults here. Um, and I understand that in APS, you work with at-risk adults and at-risk adults can, in some states, can be 18 and up. Um, I'm also not talking in capacity, and I, I wanna make this very clear. Um, I'm not talking about persons with intellectual and, de and developmental disabilities, only because that's not my particular focus. That's not my area of expertise. But I know that those are situations and uh, clients that you all are serving. So I know that I'm spending a lot of time, most of my time with older adults and to the exclusion of that particular population as well. But it's just because I don't wanna speak outside the scope of my own expertise or training. So when you think about older adults, we're, we've become a much more racially and ethically diverse population. And I say we, like I, well, I guess I am. I'm not legally an older adult, but I'm approaching it as we all are. I hope we all are. There are cultural differences within that population that have to be considered in the context of unique historical, economical, and social factors. For example, in Western culture, we take a more individualistic approach to decision making. We, we have an emphasis on autonomy, autonomous decision making. Whereas in Eastern culture, who are more collectivists, uh, they emphasize the collective decision making. They will bring in other people to help with the decision. So for example, consider an 89 year old uh, army veteran whose values was independence, who's adamant about making his own uh, treatment decisions, but in the face of failing at home and declining help from others. On the other hand, you might consider the 76 year old uh, Chinese widow who was a mother and a wife from a culture that prioritized the collective good and family responsibility and who leaned heavily on her family to provide care at home and to assist in all treatment decision making. We have to be aware of those cultural differences in order to factor them into our assessments and clinical judgments. We also want to uh, be mindful of how some cultures are very hesitant uh, or um, decline 
help from mental health professionals, from medical professionals, based on a mistrust of, you know, this is uh, very evident for African American uh, people who were told lies during the syphilis um, experiments and whose long-standing mistrust in healthcare professionals or any professional really uh, that has translated or carried over generations. This has been a topic of discussion as people are considering the risks and benefits of accepting the vaccination for COVID-19, um, where we see uh, more um, uh, declined uh, statements of not wanting the vaccine from African-American um, people. And it is based in this historical trauma that carries over. So understanding that that can impact levels of engagement. Also language barriers. And this is really difficult for me in, in terms of assessing for capacity because I live in a predominantly white uh, community in Colorado Springs. Uh, so it's very difficult sometimes to find translators. Uh, sometimes family members have to do the translating and that gets really tricky. Uh, you have to be very uh, explicit around what they can and cannot say to the client. Um, and then also just, you know, appreciating that uh, if a person has, if English is their second language, um, understanding how that may play out in their ability to express their choice or how they also perform on certain tests, on language tests, for example. Uh, next slide. Thinking about risk of harm and supervision, the level of supervision, if you will. And I really kind of hate this word. I probably should have taken it out because for me, I don't like the term supervision. It seems parental. So I like to use the term support. So what is the level of support that is required for an individual given their current situation? We want to consider their social context because we know that with increased social support, that can decrease a person's risk for a lot of things. Um, and that uh, the lack of social support will increase their risk. Some of our recommendations from the assessment should match the risk of harm or level of support that's required with what we have found on testing or what where that person is in their current situation. And we always want to make recommendations that should offer the least restric restrictive options. Now, I'm focusing on a lot of assessment with you all. And the reason why is because you need to understand how the report is written, how it should be presented, and what the kind of what the gold standard should be. If you're not getting these types of recommendations from the people that you um, refer to for these types of assessments and understanding decisional capacity, you probably need to have a conversation with them. Let them know. I need to know what level of support this person needs. So I have seen reports where the um, psychologist or neuropsychologist will just make the determination of capacity and will say something like, the person needs a guardian. Uh, they may, may or may not even say surrogate decision maker. Uh, but I don't think that that's the most helpful. I know that that's the question that they've been asked to give, but I also think that it's really important as assessors that we offer more than that. I think that the recommendations is probably the most important piece of that document. What would assist this person? Given where they are right now, what their values, what their preferences are, what their medical comorbidities are, what their um, cognitive strengths and limitations are, here's what would be helpful. This is the level of support needed to enhance that person's cognition or to enhance their overall quality of life. And if you're not getting those recommendations, please ask for it. Ask them to comment on that. Say that you need to have that because that's where we can do better uh, by providing um, person-centered interventions. Okay, next slide. So let me give you a couple of examples here. I want to uh, give you an example of an APS referral that I 
I had, uh, this is actually a couple years old, but it was a really important one um, for me because I learned a lot from this one. Um, 65 year old Hispanic male, uh, why do I put right handed? Well, I put right handed in here because sometimes it's important to know um, when we're doing neuropsychological evaluations that if a person's had a stroke, for most of us, um, our language is held in our left hemisphere. This is just a sidebar. Language is held in our left hemisphere. But if, there, if the person is left-handed, like I am, language can be held in both hemispheres. So I put their handedness because that's important from a neuropsych perspective, but it doesn't really mean anything for you all. Anyway, just a little nugget. Um, you can impress your family and friends at the next gathering if we ever have one. So this person lived alone in the, his same apartment for about eight or nine years. He'd had a history of falls, chronic back pain from a motor vehicle accident that had happened years ago. He also had pretty severe depressive symptoms that was related to family discord um, and loss. He had, been, um, he had been caring for his grandson from the time that the grandson was a toddler up until, the t uh, up until he was, I think, about eight years old. Um, he had been caring for his grandson uh, because his um, son or daughter, I can't even remember who, who the family member was, but it was his son or daughter, couldn't care for the grandson. So he was caring for him. He lost the grandson. The biological father took him back. And this created a, just an enormous amount of grief, as you can imagine. The referral question that came from APS was they wanted to know what his current level of cognitive and psychological functioning was because he had start, started missing his rent payments. Um, the, he was actually had received an eviction notice. Um, there was also some concern that there was a younger woman who was about, I think I have it listed later, but I think she was like 25 to 30 years his senior, or his junior rather, and uh, she was, just seemed like it was an odd relationship. Um, there was some concern that, you know, he was giving her some money. Um, she was kind of moving in. She also had several small children. And so um, the what prompted the concern was his apartment manager, who knew he'd always been consistent with his payments, started missing payments, was kind of forced to give him an eviction notice, but also saw this other person hanging around a lot and was concerned. So that's where the referral came, how it came to me. Next slide. These are the tests that I administered, and you're gonna have this on your handout, but just to give you a sense of kind of what goes into an evaluation. The one that I typically use, I use kind of a mid-level evaluation for capacity evals. Um, this is a repeatable battery for assessment of neuropsych status. It's called the R-bands. Also do some uh, additional language, um, some executive functioning and uh, processing speed, and then I look at some functional, I do some functional measures with the person. Next slide. You'll see he's on a big list of medications. Um, of those medications, some of the things that are, you know, piquing my interest is he's on a sleep med, he's on a depression med, he's on a migraine uh, med, he's on morphine, um, he's on an anxiolytic, uh, anti-anxiety. And so I'm thinking from a medication perspective, yikes, this guy has a lot of different meds, polypharmacy, uh, maybe some interactions with the medications that might be, you know, causing some problems with his capacity. Next slide. A couple other things. Long life tobacco use. He smokes a pack a day. Not that this is concerning, but he also might be at risk for some vascular problems, such as a stroke. No problems with alcohol use or dependency. He's got no, he's got no use of illegal substances. He had no prior psychiatric diagnosis or treatment history. Um, but look at his weight loss, 58 pounds in the last six months. That is substantial. So I'm looking at what else is going on. Is it the pain? Is it his grief and the loss and the depression that he's feeling around his, his grandson? Um, is, that, is that leading up to the weight loss? 
poor sleep, he's got fatigue, he's having um, interrupted sleep patterns, which could be a result of the uh, brain injury that happened from the motor, the motor vehicle accident. He denies having any kind of suicidal ideations. He's had no history of attempts. He uh, is a very religious man, um, practices his Catholic faith um, pretty regularly, so firmly denies uh, wanting to harm himself. Next slide. So I go, now here's the other uh, thing I should tell you. Uh, people here in Colorado know this about me, but one of the unique aspects to my assessments is I go to the individual. I don't do it all the time. If the person can come to my office, that's great. But for me, I take capacity evaluations really seriously because the determination I'm making could potentially alter this person's life very significantly, especially if their rights do end up being removed from them by virtue of a guardianship, for example. And so I, I, I like going into the home because it has more ecological validity. I want to see how the person is in their space. I want to be able to know what that looks like and how they navigate it and who else is in the space and who comes and goes into the space and who might be influencing that individual. Well, the young friend shows up unannounced. She has three small children. Um, I find out that she's got a history of domestic violence. She's got some legal problems. Her, her parents now have legal custody of her children. And she tells me that she wants to be his guardian. Um, the kind of an interesting thing that happened is we had to, he and I had taken a break from the assessment. He wanted to smoke a cigarette. So we went out onto his back deck to, to do that. And when I looked around the corner through the patio, I see the young female uh, friend uh, rifling through my file folder on the desk. Well, there's, an, there's a red flag, right? So of course I come in and I say, hey, you know, th that's confidential information. I'm gonna need to ask you to leave so that I can finish working with, working with uh, Mr. So-and-so. So these are nuances, right, that wouldn't have come in into my purview it had the person been sitting here at my desk doing the evaluation. Okay, next slide. And I'm aware of the time, so I know I have to rush through this. Essentially, he had a range of impairments, uh, processing speed, his memory, executive functioning. Obviously, I took into consideration uh, English was his second language, Spanish was his first language. So that had a, you know, there was a, um, a statement in my report that this should be interpreted with some caution because of the language. Um, performed very poorly on tasks of money management, not able to follow a four-step command. Um, lots of contributing factors and found that he was pretty vulnerable uh, to being exploited, uh, particularly by this person. Um, and so, next slide. I had determined that he needed some assistance with um, managing his financial affairs, particularly given that he was now uh, at risk for losing his housing if he couldn't make his payments or wasn't making the payments. Um, the technological assistance piece of this is for me needed to really get a hold on his pharmacological um, treatments, uh, needed to address his depression because, you know, for major depression or grief, people can be impaired in their decision making. Um, he may be so uh, grief stricken by losing his grandson that now he's more vulnerable to letting other people in his life who may not have his best interests at heart and um, needed to fully appreciate the, the impact of that grief and his depression on his decision making abilities. So, I offered that he needed to have that addressed and that I did recommend that we retest him once those things were addressed to determine really uh, what his baseline was and what kind of supportive decision making he would need or surrogate decision making. But in the interim, he definitely needed help with his finances. Next slide. Supportive decision making, really important topic. This should be an alternative to guardianship. It's an, it's an integrative framework for assessing both the personal, the environmental, the social factors that determine the level of support that an individual needs 
on a varying level of cognitive varying levels of cognitive impairment. And so most of us, myself included, we employ uh, supportive decision making in our everyday decisions. Whenever we are buying a car or signing a new lease, we look to other people to help us in that decision making. And so that should also be used in cases where a person could get some of that. You know, one of the things that I, one of the criticisms in my own community, and I think this is true across many communities, is that we really don't have advocates for older adults like we do say for children. And, and so many times I think if this person, especially the, um, the term you're probably familiar with, the unbefriended older adult, the person who's living in the community without any natural supports, if they had an advocate, they don't necessarily need a guardian. They need an advocate. They need somebody who understands their values, their preferences, and help them through some decision making, spending the time with them to get to what they want and and to help them follow through with that and that's something that we need to do better of is to use that language in how we think through what a person needs and the level of support they need next slide some of the challenges always with capacity is that we're asking sometimes as a as a, an assessor i'm asked to make a decision as to yes or no but we know that um those types of de those types of decisions cannot be done on a continuous ability so cognition is continuous it's fluid and it can fluctuate over time depending moment to moment health awareness of the individual it's impacted by those factors i i mentioned and people have the the ability to exercise poor judgment even if it's um eccentric next slide and you've seen this image before, I understand from Andy, but it's one of my favorites too. Um, I make, you know, I'm making poor decisions and I'll probably continue to make poor decisions into my 80s. So we have to respect that. We have to respect within the context of a person has the capacity to make a poor decision, we let them do that. And sometimes with APS, I say this often, not, not too much, but when I do, it, um, it has some relevance. We sometimes have to wait for the bad thing to happen. We're seeing that the person's making poor decision after poor decision, and yet until the bad thing happens, we may not be able to intervene in the way that will that will help that person the most. Next slide. Some challenges. There's really poor agreement from one psychologist to the next, to the next neuropsychologist. And we have found this over research that based on our individual training, my training is only in geriatrics, but compared to a neuropsychologist who's a generalist, we might have a very different, I think geropsychologists are really well equipped to do capacity evaluations because we see the person through a biopsychosocial spiritual framework that is so ingrained in our training that I think that we do a great job of this. But we're, there's going to be variability, uh, different methods that are used, different types of training backgrounds. And so you're going to find that across uh, uh, providers. Next slide. How do we maximize capacity? Well, we want to maximize by treating the person's uh, deficits, whatever that is. We want to present the information that can enhance their, their communication or capacity and understanding. So using visual aids, um, making sure that we repeat information, the time of day that we're with people. It needs to be in the morning, especially with older adults or people with any kind of brain or neurocognitive disorder. People often are better in the beginning parts of the day. So time of day is important. Um, test their decision-making ability that's not just determined by their short-term memory. We want to give people all the information and then provide it to them in the moment and then ask them about it again and see if they're able to understand it and give us the same answer. Accounting for hearing or visual impairments that can mask other, other diagnoses such as dementia. Um, I provide a pocket talker or I keep one with me in my assessments in case the person doesn't have hearing aids, can't have lost their hearing aids, the batteries run out. Um, I want to make sure that they can hear me. Accounting that if English is their second language, speaking slowly, 
chunking information, um, asking people, tell me, repeat back to me what I've just said to you to understand uh, if they're getting all the information and minimizing distractions when we're having these important conversations. When I do home evaluations, I make sure the TV gets turned off. If there are people around, I make sure that they leave the room so that I can be alone with the individual. So minimizing those distractions and background noise can enhance a person's ability to communicate and take in the information. Okay, next slide. So. I'm going to skip this case example. So, um, you'll have it on your slides because for in interest of time, I know we're at the end. Um, Leslie, can you go to, oh dear, can you go to slide, I guess, 44, keep going. I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going, keep going. Hmm. Let's go to, um, yeah, let's stay here, enhancing capacity. Um, no, where am I? Let's go to the referral piece. We've already, I've already kind of talked about this. Go next, referral process. Ways that you can, as APS, help us as assessors is to make sure that embedded in that referral question, you need to know what outcome you're looking for. Does this person have the ability or capacity to do X? Does this, what is this person's uh, least restrictive living environment? What is the least restrictive level of support this person needs? What's the prognosis? Do you need a diagnosis? I need a diagnosis. What's the prognosis? What would be the anticipated treatment and recovery to enhance the person's capacity? When sending that referral, you gotta be specific about the what and when, because sometimes I'll get a referral and it'll say assess for capacity. Do you know, that's not effective. I will then have to call you. We're gonna have a conversation about that. So I'm hoping that this webinar has really, you know, empowered you, given you some additional tools so that you can, you know, better refine that referral question. Also, the sharing of records and documentation to aid in the assessment is really important. And um, let's see, next slide. Um, I've kind of already talked about this. Um, we want to always, you know, make the recommendation to enhance their uh, capacity, understand that capacity does change over time. So sometimes we may want to reevaluate. And sometimes I will say, uh, if this person has treatment, uh, reevaluate in six months to one year. Um, the person also always has a right to contest a decision. I come, I do a lot of these assessments where the person says, I don't believe I need a guardian anymore. Or even APS will call me and say, this person's had a guardian for 12 years and I think they're doing fine. Would you reassess to see if this is the least restrictive option for them? Next slide. Okay, gosh, I'm right down to the wire. So this last slide, I just wanna say, I do watercolor, and this is a watercolor that I painted in the fall. And it's relevant in this context because it, to me, it symbolizes the path. It symbolizes that we're on the path together, that we're journeying, 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 <laughs> I can't even say that word. We're on this journey together, side by side. And I learned just as much from you APS, as you may learn from me. And that is the importance of collaboration. We, in these types of uh, big topics, and there's so many people on this call, which infers to me, tells me that this is a topic that is really important to you all, that we are in it together. So I want you to know that you have a Jero psychologist in your pocket now, and you can you know, reach out to me if there is additional training you need or if you wanna consult on something. Um, I'm happy to follow up with you on any number of these issues that I raised up in this webinar. And I wanted, I know we only have a minute, so I'm so sorry, but if there's a burning question that Andy, you could bring to me, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, certainly. And thank you, Dr. Gibson. And I know you had a lot of information planned today. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of it, but yeah, we, we do have a few questions. Um, one comment that was made um, that the Administration for Community Living has funded work that looks at various approaches to advocates um, for persons under guardianship to support decision-making and what have you. So you can reach out to us. Um, our contact information will be available in a little bit if you'd like some more information about that. And then we do have some questions. There's one, 
about, um, you know, why do you feel that doctors or uh, personal care physicians, primary care physicians, are reluctant to complete competency assessments for their patients? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I do. Well, a couple of thoughts. Um, one, it could be a lack of training by some physicians. Uh, I've met physicians who will say, I ain't touching that. Um, I don't want to make that big that big decision. I don't know how to do it. I've actually trained a few physicians here in my community to do medical capacity evaluations. Um, now, there's a lot of tools and resources to physicians to do that, and they do have the ability, but I think it comes from either a lack of uh, knowledge and skill around it. And I know a lot of physicians, as are a lot of psychologists actually, they don't want to be involved in a capacity evaluation because they'll have to testify in a hearing. Mm -hmm. Not all the time, but it's that fear and, and not being familiar with the legal process, not understanding it, uh, that they tend to not want to, to, to go down that road. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Um, are there any specific assessments or evaluations recommended to determine if an older adult has the capacity to consent to sexual relations? So basically, we're looking at capacity to consent to sex. Yep. Um, there, to my knowledge, and, and again, I'm you know I may be missing something, but to my knowledge, I don't know of any sexual specific mm -hmm. uh, measure. But what we, when I have assessed for it, first I always do some kind of cognitive evaluation, um, but I also uh, look at those four elements of, of consent that I mentioned earlier, because that applies to sexual consent. Can they state their preference? Do they have an understanding and awareness and insight? And does their uh, thought process follow a, a logical path? And that's really the essence of getting sexual consent. Sure. Great. Um, another question. You talked about polypharmacy a little bit, um, and we saw quite a med list from the person that you were talking about. In cases of polypharmacy, would you recommend meds evaluation and then reassess again at a later time? Absolutely. And I have done that. Um, I've, I've requested a, an evaluation, a review of the medications. Um, one of the things that I will do is, uh, with the consent of the patient, um, is to send my evaluation to the provider directly and highlight for them, please review these medications mm -hmm. to see if there be something uh, changed. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, the, pe the person is getting their, uh, their medications from different providers who aren't sharing and who are not talking to one another. So I will, um, sometimes I will try to bridge that, but I will definitely make the case to review it and to come back for testing once those have been reviewed and if any changes have been made. Great. And I think we'll go with one more question. Um, as a mental health professional, would you recommend doing a baseline cognitive assessment on an older adult um, or would you wait until you see issues with their cognition before doing an assessment? So I think the question is, do you do a baseline and then do it again later if you see problems or do you just wait until there are problems? That's such a beautiful question and thank you for asking it. As a geropsychologist, one of the platforms that most of us stand on is that everybody should get a baseline cognitive evaluation from the time you're at age 65, and then probably every, say, could be three to five years, unless something changes. Uh, but I do recommend that. And, um, you know, Medicare will pay for those evaluations uh, if it's a medical necessity that is um, ordered through a physician. But I think that even uh, one of the things that we've really pushed in primary care is that primary care should be doing, you know, just kind of a basic screening, such as most of you are familiar with the slums, uh, the St. Louis University mental status exam, or the Montreal cognitive assessment. Um, they should be doing those in primary care to keep that on file and to keep redoing it every year to track a person. And then when things start to decline to then uh, refer out for maybe a deeper neuropsychological evaluation to get a diagnosis. But absolutely, that should be done at the same level of relevance and importance as a colonoscopy or a mammogram. This is some, because when we know the information, it gives families and patients uh, the insight or time to either plan 
or to make lifestyle changes that can reverse any kind of potential deficits that are there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibson. This was fantastic information. There's a whole bunch of thank you. Please thank Dr. Gibson comments coming in right now. So I wanted to relay okay. those to you. I think people thoroughly enjoyed this. And um, if we can go to the very last slide, there's some contact information for the APS TARC on there. Um, you see our website, you've got the email address. Again, you can download these slides in the handout section, but we'll also post these slides online along with the recording today that you can access. Thank you so much for being with us today. And again, thank you, Dr. Gibson, for giving us this excellent information. I thought it was fantastic. Um, we thank hope you. Everybody, we hope everybody has a great afternoon. Take care, folks. Bye.